he has been um, probably, I would say, one of the two or three people, no more than three, who have had more influence in bringing about the Brexit referendum result and in raising this question to the level it's, it has been a dominating question in British politics in the last few years, and I want to thank him for that very much indeed. He's helped to revive our democracy enormously. Uh, but now, having said that, uh, let's go back quickly to that last item, which I know you want to uh, well, I, I come in. I was really interested by, I mean, I'm always, thank you for your very kind words, John. You're always far too generous about me, but I always appreciate it. And I was really <laughs> interested in the, 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 the conversation you were having with Philip. In his typically brilliant speech earlier, Roger Scruton spoke about the politics of the first person plural and the essence of the nation state in terms of we. And I, I would make, I'd extend that argument generally mm. to a definition of conservatism. Mm. If, we, if, we, uh, if we add a verb to the pronoun, uh, liberalism you can characterize as I will. Mm. Uh, socialism you would characterize as you must. Mm. But conservatism you would characterize as we ought. Yeah. And that ought is based on a recognition of common affinities, common loyalties. It's the recognition that we have something in common with one another, enough to make us accept authority from the same source. It's why you pay taxes to support people that you've never met. It's why you obey laws when you think they're stupid laws. Uh, it's why you accept an election result when you lose, which is, hmm. from my point of view, just as well at the moment. Uh, those things happen when you feel that you have that shared identity. And that's why fundamentally a, a liberal democracy can work in Portugal or in Sweden or in Hungary in a way that it can't work at global or at European level. Fine, now um, having said that, uh, you're, you're also one of the few, uh, um, well, maybe almost the last person in the Brexit debate who has, I think, so far refrained from denouncing the EU, uh, particular um, statements and follies, but, but in general, you, you still want to hold out the hand of friendship to the EU. Uh, you see it as an ally. You see it as a, in, for the countries that want it, beneficial organization. Your argument, I think, has been, it, it may be terrific, but it doesn't suit us. Yes, I think there's something in that. I mean, first of all, whatever our relationship with the EU, it is going to be an important one. These countries are our geographical neighbors, they're our friends, our allies. They've been our allies for a long time. Uh, and it would be bizarre for us to imagine a future where we had a hostile standoff, right? So mm. I, I, I always think it, you know, you can be an independent country while having very, very close and friendly relations with your neighbors. I, I think in, in this context of Canada's relation, with the United States. Mm. Canada has on its doorstep a federal union, a federal union with about 10 times its population. Canada has the closest relationship with that union compatible with being a fully sovereign mm. country. So in terms of defense, in terms of intelligence sharing, uh, in terms of you know, common rules on immigration and so on, it has gone as close as it can while remaining clearly an independent and sovereign state whose laws are preeminent on its own soil. I, I don't see how having that relationship with the European Union is some kind of sellout. I mean, no one says that Canada is, a, is, is not an independent country. It, it's a, a, a rather regrettable hardening of positions on both sides that has, has led to people only talking to their own tribe, looking for, for heretics rather than looking for converts. And what was a, before and during and immediately after the referendum a completely uncontroversial Brexit position, which is we want to be a sovereign country and then to have close and friendly relations with the EU. What a sad thing that that is now howled down as some sort of sellout. Yes, and, but is it the case, uh, obviously, you know, I think we would hope it would be, but is it the case that if we were to leave, let's just assume a no-deal Brexit, that afterwards, um, and after presumably a period in which bruised feelings are uh, gradually soothed, um, we can go back and form some kind of cooperative relationship on the basis of our having left for good. I think that's, that, that would almost inevitably follow. The question is whether you, how, yeah. how disruptive does the transition have to be? And of course, that's not entirely up to us. The EU will, will have a, a big part to play in that. Uh, but I, I just come back to saying, you know, for, for 
all, I've, I've been in this nearly 30 years in this fight, and for all that time, we had the aspiration of common market, not common government. And no one ever said, but that's not real Brexit, or, that, you know, or that's a soft kind of Brexit. Every, everyone, until about a year ago, said, oh yeah, that would be great. You know, uh, it's, it's quite important, I think, that we should create a political space in this country. And the reason I'm standing again for election is partly to offer this. Yeah. The last thing I want to do is to be fighting uh, a, a fifth election. But we can't allow the Brexit cause to be completely Trumpified. There has to be a space in British politics for people who want an amicable, orderly, economically liberal Brexit that ends up with close relations with every continent, including Europe. Well, does that mean, or what does it mean in this regard? The single market is a regulatory apparatus, fundamentally. Um, and one of the reasons that we, don't, we, we sometimes don't like it is because uh, we have to conform in matters which we think are not legitimate part of inter-European trade, but also we would just do some of those things differently ourselves. And after all, we might want to do those things differently because we have other markets too. So mm. would, would the single market mm. um, be part of that so vision? I think, I think we need to be really hard-headed about this and say, where do we need freedom to diverge yeah. in terms of boosting our economy yeah. and boosting our prosperity. Uh, in quite a lot of the areas that uh, cover manufactured standards, the, the standards are almost completely set at global level. Yeah. Uh, our car manufacturers, if they were allowed to diverge significantly from EU standards, would have a freedom that they would never in practice use because those are the same standards when they export to Abu Dhabi or Bombay or wherever. Uh, so you need to be quite uh, uh, deliberate about where is it important to have divergence. I'll tell you who's done this very well, I think, is the Swiss. The Swiss basically diverge in most services. They diverge in, including in financial services. Their financial services sector in per capita terms is twice as big as ours, so the, the divergence has suited them extremely well. But when it comes to things like pharmaceuticals, for reasons of economy of scale, they are following all of the same rules anyway. Of course they are, as we would be. Just that, that they, they tend to be global rules. So in, if that is the situation anyway, if you're already producing to the same standard, then why not make a virtue of the fact and forego the additional checks and paperwork and so on that would be required? Okay, so you would lower the temperature, then act in a hard-headed way, and that would presumably include, for example, uh, not uh, imposing uh, regulatory rules that were burdensome um, on, on anyone, I suppose, but, uh, but on the companies which don't export to Europe, yeah. that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, for, for me, Brexit is a means to an end. It yeah. always was. And the end is a freer, more prosperous, more democratic, and more global Britain. So I, I, I want us to be re-engaging with the markets which are growing in the world, which is basically the whole of the world except Europe. So, uh, that, that, of course, we need to have more, more freedom to do that. That should not be incompatible yeah. with having close commercial relations with our immediate neighbors. Yeah. You know, the Swiss are, again, a very good example. They have a free trade agreement with China. They have a free trade agreement with the Philippines that's just entered into force the other day. You know, and yet, they also have a, a, a very good deal with the EU based on, because, you know, when people say, do you want to be in the single market? It, it's quite, again, it's quite important to be detailed about this. The single market is not a single entity yeah. that you sign on the dotted line for. You know, it is an agglomeration of different requirements and obligations, some of which are absolutely fine, some of which are neither good nor bad, some of which are, are not in our interest and we should opt out of. But the, I've always thought the fundamental basis of the single market is the rule that says you may not discriminate against goods or services from another country purely on grounds of nationality. Now, you know, as a, as a pro-market conservative, I can't for the life of me see why we would not want to keep that rule anyway. I, I would like to have that rule with every country in the world. I'm, I'm inviting you now to take aim at Philip a bit, but um, would you describe yourself, would it be fair to describe you as a free trade nationalist? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly a free trader, uh, and I'm a, an uncomplicated unilateral free trader. Uh, I also believe that democracy requires a demos, that you need to work within a unit where people feel that they have a, a, a shared identity. It was a, a very famous broadcast that de Gaulle made in 1942 from, from London uh, to the Free French, where he said, democracy and national sovereignty are the same thing. La démocratie se confond pour moi exactement avec la souveraineté nationale. C'est le gouvernement du peuple pour le peuple. Now, which then immediately raises the question, you know, who, which, which peuple? What do you mean? 
And of course, he, what he meant was the only way in which you can get democracy to work is if people feel enough in common, one with another, to accept common government from each other's hands. And he, he knew that they had that within France. He also knew that they didn't have it within the, 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 the new order uh, that the fascists were trying to create in Europe. How odd that that should now sound antiquated to us. I mean, it, it, when he was saying it, it was, it was a fairly standard, radical, democratic position, right? It, it, it had been the basic position of most revolutionary Democrats in Europe since the, the 1848 Risings. Uh, there's a, a, a bizarre squeamishness in our own generation about this, which I think would have been incomprehensible to those who came before us. Yes. Um, I now want to talk about other identities and, and other relationships. Um, you're particularly associated with the notion of the Anglosphere. Mm. And um, in, in your view, does that, what kind of uh, future does that offer the British outside Europe? Uh, and what kind of, um, of, what kind of position does it mean Britain would occupy in the relations between, say, Australia and Europe? So the, the, the Anglosphere is based on the idea that shared institutions and a shared political and cultural heritage gives countries those uh, congruities mm. of interest, those, those similarities of outlook. Uh, that if you have a common law system and you, you, you consciously base your political system on an uh, inheritance that you trace back to the Glorious Revolution and Magna Carta and all the rest of it, that that gives you a, a certain way of looking at the world that emphasizes property rights, that, en that elevates the individual above the collective, that is particularly focused on the rule of law. And I would argue that it's a pretty darn good system. Yeah. I would say that Anglosphere values are why Bermuda is not Haiti. You know, Anglosphere values are why Hong Kong is not China. Anglosphere values are why Singapore is not Indonesia. Uh, and, and since we're at uh, 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 Yoram's thing, they're why Israel, which we always forget, uh, is also, of course, a common law country. We don't think of it as a, as a former British colony, but it had the same uh, constitutional inheritance as, as the others. It's why Israel is not Syria or is not Iraq. Uh, so it's not a bad system. And, and there's, again, there's a funny squeamishness about admitting this, as though, uh, uh, as though coming out with what I've just said, which strikes me as a fairly uncontentious statement, is... Uh, therefore, a nostalgia for, for the British Empire and, and, and wanting to turn the clock back to the 19th century. It's really about interoperable systems. I would like to, to have a, uh, a network of Anglosphere countries that is based not only on a political and military alliance, which we've broadly got, but is based on complete open free trade, by which I mean absolute mutual recognition that if something is legal in Singapore, it should automatically be legal here, and vice versa. You know, if, if a drug is approved by the FDA, that should be enough for us. We shouldn't need any additional uh, tests. And if someone is, is qualified to, to, to practice a, a, as a trader in London, he should automatically be allowed to practice on Wall Street. If you did that, you're talking about slightly more than a third of the world's economy, and you had absolute reciprocity, then suddenly you have not only a larger, but a better way of doing business than the European Union, because it's not based on standardization. It's based on opening things M mutual, up. And, and mutual stand, uh, recognition. Exactly. So that um, you get away from the corporatism yeah. and you have capitalism for the, for the consumer. Yeah. With small, small companies being, uh, well, not as influential, but more influential than and, that. And the, and, and, and the little guy is the, yeah. I mean, the consumer ultimately is the winner. Because what, what yeah. I mean, I, I saw this in, in Brussels as, a, as an MEP when they were looking at the, yeah. the TTIP talks. You, you could you could identify clear occasions when European and American multinationals had obviously got together yeah. and said, hey, <laughs> let's take the worst of your regulations yeah. and mush them together with the worst of our regulations, and that way we will raise barriers to entry so high that no one will ever be able to challenge us, and we will enjoy a monopoly or an oligopoly in perpetuity. And that happens when you have bureaucrats setting common standards. But as soon as you say, no, 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 look, what, we trust you. We trust yeah. your regulators. They're common law, uh, free market types like us. If they, if they call this a car or an apple or whatever, that's good enough for us. As soon as you do that, prices start falling and you have free trade delivering for the masses. And presumably you would have, in this Anglosphere arrangement, too, uh, immigration preferences. Uh, it would be easier for people from the Commonwealth to immigrate. I would ideally say that 
there should be a principle, an implied principle, that you have the right to take up a job in any of the other countries. Okay. So without welfare, without family unification, without voting rights or citizenship or anything like that, but that there should be a fundamental right to take up a job in any of the other countries. I think there was a great Canadian sociologist um, in the end of the 19th century who proposed something very similar to that, which he called the moral citizenship of the English-speaking world. And that was then a live idea, but of course the 20th century it's got really in It's really interesting what it founded on, and it was very much of its time. Uh, it, 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 it says both good and bad things about the, the state of imperial thought, but the good thing is people recognized that they couldn't exclude India. Yes. If they were going to go down this road of having some kind of confederal imperial system that eventually you would have to admit India. And of course, they also realized yeah. that that would mean that it would effectively become an Indian system yes. because two thirds of the population was in India, the, 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 the capital was gonna end up in Delhi yeah. and that Britain and Canada and, and the rest would all become satellites of yeah. India. Now that, to the Victorian mind, was a step too far. I wonder though whether uh, India is still, of course, at a, at, a, at a different level of development from the others, but whether uh, that shouldn't be our long-term aspiration, that India reaches a level of economic development where it does become a key component of, uh, of an Anglosphere system, because I think that the, the self-identification of India is probably the key geopolitical question of this century. Does India primarily see itself as an Anglosphere democracy, or does it primarily see itself as an Asian superpower? If it's the former, then the world is an altogether warmer and happier place. Let me actually ask a somewhat darker question, which has been occurring to me in the last week and few months. Um, much of the opposition uh, to Brexit here, and also much of the opposition which you get in the circles which discuss these questions to Anglosphere notions, um, seems to me at least to be saturated with what I would call cultural self-hatred, cultural mm. masochism. And that's certainly a fuel of the extremists on that side of the debate. Where does that come from? How can it be tackled? I mean, I, I, I always think it's important not to judge a cause by its ugliest sure. and most vocal yeah. advocates. So, so uh, just as I would not want Brexit to be judged by the nastiest people on social media, so yeah. I don't think it's fair to judge Remain by the people who want there to be a recession, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. and who, uh, who can't quite hide their disappointment at the fact that uh, their fellow countrymen are not in penury. Um, but I think there is, it is certainly the case that there is an element in the uh, Euro integrationist cause in this country mm. that there wouldn't be in Norway or in yeah. you know, Lithuania and so on. And, and it is caught up with uh, the concept of hierarchies of, of privilege and, and you know, Britain broadly being seen as an oppressor rather than a victim. Yeah. And that, that gives uh, uh, British patriotism a an unattractive veneer to a, a, a certain kind of leftist here in a way that I just don't think it's an issue if you're an Icelandic Eurosceptic. You know, you, no. you don't have to go around uh, explaining that you don't look down on the rest of the world and you know, all the rest of it. But it is, it is very s similar to what's found in the United States in a non-Brexit context. Yes, that there is, yes it's but, but for, and for the same reason, that, yeah. that, that, that Britain and America have tended for reasons, uh, I would say because they have a better market system and a better political system, have, have tended to be technologically superior to their adversaries and therefore down the years have tended to be on the winning side. And for people for whom the biggest issue is standing up for the underdog, that puts us on the wrong side, even though we may have been on any other centre-left definition, the place where you would have most wanted to be female or, or poor or from a religious minority or whatever. They, they can't get past the, the, the hierarchy thing, that, that, that here is Britain uh, defeating a smaller or poorer or more backward country, however uh, superior our system may have been by any other definition. Right. We have 39 seconds left, so I'm now going to ask you the political question. What is happening here? What should happen? Um, what is uh, Theresa going to make? What is Theresa May going to do? Well, I mean, th th this is the last thing I wanted to be doing now. I'm sorry, not talking to you. That is always a huge <laughs> pleasure, or indeed performing in front of the, 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 this brilliant audience, which, by the way, alarms me to think that all of the believers of the nation state are gathered in one place. There's some kind of <laughs> security risk here. Uh, it, it, I'm, I'm glad we're getting towards the end. But so, so that that is a huge pleasure and worth taking time out of the election campaign to do. But I did not want to be fighting an election campaign. Of course, I didn't. I mean, I assumed it would all be over by now. 
In the end, I, I looked at this from every angle I could, and I could not think of a way of honorably not contesting the election. 